Good morning to you as we gather for worship again, even though we continue to be scattered. Hopefully it's going to only be a couple of more weeks as we do this. It looks like for the state of North Carolina, things are starting to kind of loosen up. So we're going to keep uh, a watch on all that's taking place and we'll obviously be getting word out to you. But uh, for the time being, we're going to continue to the shelter in place, continue to be able to do our services online like this. Do want to take the time to wish all our mothers a happy Mother's Day. Uh, even if you're not watching this as it premieres, uh, hope that you had a wonderful Mother's Day. But uh, if you are watching this with us uh, this morning, we hope that uh, you do have a wonderful day and uh, make sure that that family takes care of you very well. But I uh, do want to use this opportunity to, to look to God's word for his word for us, we're going to be continuing our series on majoring in the minors. We started it last week as we looked at the prophet of Hosea. And go ahead and apologize right here, right now. I had no idea that uh, it was going to be an hour-long sermon. And if you stuck all the way through with it, then God bless you. Uh, that's all I can say. And uh, don't make any promises about the day as we're going to be looking at Joel and we're actually going to look at all three chapters of Joel. So hope that you'll bear with me in case it goes long again. Praying that it doesn't, but uh, it's not like you got anywhere to be, right? So uh, that being said, we are going to be in Joel as we're continuing our majoring on the minors. We're looking at the minor prophets in that series and uh, of course, there's 12 minor prophets, and we're going to be looking at all 12 of them over the course of our weeks together. Uh, so this is week two, part two of that series, and we're going to be, again, as I said, in the book of Joel. And, and really kind of looking at all of these minor prophets from the perspective of eternal questions that God answers. Uh, all, all of these types of questions that humanity has always had, and, and God is answering them in these books. So the eternal question last week was, what is love? And we looked at what love is through the eyes of God and what true unconditional love looks like uh, in the life of Hosea and Gomer and how that represented God's love towards his chosen people, uh, namely the nation of Israel, but also to to the humanity at large and, and to us and our place in that story and how we live that love out. So we looked at last week, what is love? This week, the, that burning question is, who will be saved? Who will be saved? And so Joel is going to answer that for us uh, today. So hopefully you found the book of Joel by now. And uh, that's the good thing about this series is you know where we're going to be each week. So you can go ahead and turn there um, before we get started. And we're just going right in order of the 12 books there in the Minor Prophets. And of course, you know, a lot of times we do have difficulty finding these books. It's not like uh, we go and do a whole lot of studying in those books. Uh, so some of these are very unfamiliar to us, but they're all worthwhile. It's all God's word from Genesis to Revelation, all in between. It's all God's word. And we need to study his word. We need to know his word. So I hope that uh, you are looking forward to our time together in the Minor Prophets as we are, are getting into some of these lesser known, lesser studied books of the Bible. Uh, as we look at it, and again, as we did last week, not going to read a chunk of scripture to begin with and then come back to it. We're just going to kind of work our way through the book. And so uh, that's uh, going to be our plan here on out. So looking at Joel, uh, just a little bit of kind of story on Joel himself. Uh, the prophet Joel appears out of nowhere. Uh, verse 1 uh, tells us nothing about Joel other than his father's name. There it says the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And so that's really all we know about Joel. We don't know if he had a wife. We don't know if he had his family. We don't know who the king is. We don't know his trade. We know nothing about him. His likes, his dislikes, his hobbies, his habits, nothing uh, is known about who Joel is. And so you almost have to play detective to be able to pull some of these things out uh, about his time. Uh, he does address the temple and the priest. Uh, he mentions Jerusalem and Judah. So it's probably that he's from uh, the southern kingdom. He's probably prophesying to the southern kingdom. Uh, but really, uh, and this is from scholars who agree on everything else, 
they don't agree on a date. It ranges from anywhere in the 9th century B.C. all the way to the 4th century B.C. But ultimately, what we are reminded here is that the book of Joel is not about Joel. It's about God. It's about Joel's God. It's about the Lord's judgment and salvation. So Joel here is simply a faithful messenger. And because we don't have a lot of historical background or, or details, uh, it's easy for us to be able to apply his timeless message to our lives today. Joel's name literally means Yahweh is God. And in fact, that's kind of the, the reoccurring theme throughout here, uh, speaking about the day of the Lord. It appears in chapter 1, chapter 2 a couple of times, chapter 3 a couple of times. Uh, it also appears in other minor prophets like Amos and Zephaniah and Malachi. Ultimately, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment and salvation. To Joel, uh, it refers to a particular invasion of locusts as a form of judgment on Israel. It, it speaks to the defeat and destruction of Israel by an invading army. Uh, it speaks to the final uh, defeat of God's enemies and ultimately God's final vindication of God and his people. So that's kind of where we're going as we think about all of this. Uh, in, indeed, uh, the... In, day, in Joel's day, it was this mindset of this, this great commander who would come and defeat his enemies in a single day, in a single battle. And so here for the prophets, the Lord is stepping in. He's righting all the wrongs. He's vindicating his people. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's over when God shows up. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. The day of the Lord is the day that God steps into history to do a specific work, whether it's to judge or to deliver. And of course, the New Testament picks this up. It picks it up as Paul talks about the final judgment as the day of Jesus Christ. So as we get into Joel's uh, message here for us, basically there's three sequences of judgment. There's the immediate there's the intimate, and there's the ultimate. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning as we look at the book of Joel. The immediate, the intimate, imminent, and ultimate. Now, it, when we're speaking about the immediate judgment, we're talking about the locust plague there in chapter 1. The, the intimate judgment is the army's invasion in chapter 2, and the ultimate judgment in chapter 3 is on God's enemies and salvation to his people. So Joel here uses the invasion of the locusts to really be able to pre, be a prelude to all the further judgment that's coming, a, a worse judgment. Uh, an army is coming, and even after the army, there's something even worse coming, final judgment. So it's, it's gradually getting worse, Joel says here. Uh, really, the locust and the army that Joel is talking about really uh, communicate this thought. You ain't seen nothing yet. You think the locusts were bad. You think the army was bad. You just wait until God himself shows up. So the urgency of Joel is to hear this, to awaken, to blow the trumpet. It's, it's a warning call that Joel is giving to his readers, to his listeners. You need to understand what God is doing and wake up and respond appropriately. You need to repent. So, again, we're going to see how this lays out. And last week we talked about uh, the Richard Sibbs quote that kind of summarized Hosea very well, that there's more mercy in Christ than there's sin in us. Well, to kind of think of another quote that helps us understand the message of Joel here comes from Timothy Keller. Timothy Keller says, We are far worse than we ever imagined, and far more loved than we could ever dreamed. We're far worse than we ever could imagine, and we're far more loved than we could ever dream. So we're going to look at that quote in, in light of what Joel was saying, and, and so there's a two-part outline to what we're going to be looking at today. First, that judgment is far worse than we've ever imagined, and two, salvation 
is far greater than we've ever dreamed. Regardless of how you interpret the different details of Joel, whether it's really locusts and really armies or what have you, those two truths are abundantly clear. Judgment is far worse than we've ever imagined, but salvation is far greater than we've ever imagined. Before we dive into the text, though, would you pray with me? Father God, we just want to pause here in this moment as we prepare to, to once again dive into your word so that you might prepare us. So that as you speak to us, that we would be ready to hear and respond. Father, indeed, may our, our hearts be open to your message to today. For us to understand that judgment is far worse than we could imagine, and yet salvation is so much greater than we've ever imagined, could ever dream. So, Father, that you would use this time as we unpack your word, even as you spoke it through the prophet thousands of years ago, to know that your word is still true and faithful today. That it will divide to the very heart of the matter. So, Lord, may we fall under your word today. May we fall under your spirit today. That you would use this time for your glory. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, first... Judgment is far worse than we've ever imagined. Uh, these verses that we're going to look at are not the type of verses that you're going to find on a daily affirmation desk calendar, you know, and words to live by. You know, people aren't going to be crocheting this into throw rugs or to throw blankets. Uh, these, these are awful, awful words of judgment. But first he deals with this immediate judgment, which is a locust invasion uh, you see this in verses 2 through 20. Again, there's debate on whether or not this is symbolic or that it actually took place. Uh, could he be using a locust invasion to speak in, you know, to be, be speaking symbolically about uh, army invasion? The army invasion in chapter 2 is an illustration of locust or is it an actual army invasion? Uh, is it all symbolic of the final day of the Lord or some combination of all of those things? Well, for various reasons, I take them as real events, namely because the final judgment is going to be a real event. Therefore, I believe that Joel is speaking about real events here. A real locust invasion occurred. A real threat of an enemy army occurred. Both of these are previews of a far more dreadful day, the ultimate day of the Lord. So he says here, uh, in the, as he begins to unpack all of this, uh, that nothing has happened like this before. Verse 2 and verse 3. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your day or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another, gen uh, to another generation. Nothing has happened like this before. Uh, this idea, this swarm of locusts is an uh, unbelievable sight. You could go and Google what locust swarms are capable of doing, the destruction that they're able to do. There was actually back in 2004 in West Africa, a swarm that moved from West Africa uh, to Egypt up to Jordan and into Israel. And one swarm in Monaco, um, excuse me, Morocco, was almost two football fields across and 140 miles long. That's a lot of grasshoppers, a lot of locusts. There was estimated a 69 billion locusts within that swarm. What they don't eat, they cut off for entertainment, one official said. Uh, a farmer said they ate everything but my mortgage. You know, they, they had this horrible sound, and when they all swarm together, it, it, it's almost like a huge jet engine that just is deafening. Uh, what what uh, Joel here is describing, you know, as he hears about all that's taking place, is like something out of a horror movie. Nothing like this has ever happened before. 
It'd be like us sitting around and saying, hey, back in the day, Floyd, uh, as that hurricane, the floods that came after it, was just you know, a sight to be unseen. You know, it was a 500,000-year uh, flood. Of course, you know, we've had one even since then. But, you know, or the blizzard of 81, people sit around and want to talk about that. You know, what we see here is it's that sort of thing that is told for generations of how horrible it is. It's like how even now, almost 100 years later, we're still talking about the Great Depression of the 20th century. Notice what he goes on to say here. There were cutting locusts. What the cutting locusts left, the swarming locusts had eaten. What the swarming locusts left, the hopping locusts had eaten. What the hopping locusts left, the destroying locusts had eaten. Cutting, swarming, hopping, destroying. Basically, nothing is left. Nothing. All of it is taken away. Joel is trying to wake the people up. He says, Awake, you drunkards, weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Drunkards are often asleep, and, and drinkers are often happy, but Joel says here the situation changes everything. You need to wake up. You need to realize the gravity of the situation. What's coming is, is unheard of. It's unfathomable. They're even referred to as an army there in verse 6. And seven, for a nation has come against my land, and powerful and, and beyond number, its teeth and lion, its teeth are lion's teeth. It has fangs of a lioness. It's laid waste my vine and splendor my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. He goes on to say, lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering, the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. People here are called to do opposite of what they normally do. They're to, they're to betray, I mean, they're to, to grieve like the betrothed who, whose promised husband dies before the wedding. Priests are to mourn because they can't offer sacrifices due to the, the invasion upon the land. Basically, everything that they know, life as they know it, has changed forever. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Even in verse 10, we see that the basic necessities have failed. The grain for bread is gone. The wine to drink is gone. All for cooking and cleaning and soothing. All of that is gone. There's nothing left. Now, if you remember back in Hosea last week, we saw how those things were a blessing from the Lord, and yet they had attributed it to the, the false gods. All of these are meant to be gifts from God. So here is really a picture of a curse. It's a judgment. You have not done what I've called you to do. You haven't followed in my uh, commandments and statutes. So instead of being blessed and having these provisions, they're going to be removed from you. Verse 11, be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Well, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. Again, it's a picture of reversal. The farmers here are usually zealous and they're determined workers, but they're, but they're told to be ashamed. Verse 12, the vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Everything is dried up, everything is mourning, everything is sorrowful. Four sources of joy are found in this chapter. Food and drink, a wedding marriage, the harvest, worship. All of these are meant to be gifts from God that we enjoy and we celebrate and we give thanks for. But because of the locust invasion, they're all taken away. It, it's dark. It's desolate. There's nothing that is left. It, it's a, a horrible situation to be in. It's a trying time. It, really what it's done is it's meant for them to wake up. It's meant to grab their attention. It's meant to shout to them. You need to be paying attention to what God is trying to tell you. And what is it that he's trying to tell you? Notice verses 13 through 20. 
Put on sackcloth and lament, O priest. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the, the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God. Cry out to the Lord, alas, for the day. For the day of the Lord is near and has destruction from the Almighty. It comes. Is not the food cut off before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the claws. The storehouses are desolate. The granaries are torn down because the grain has dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. This is what you're supposed to do. Cry out to God. He's getting your attention. He's trying to get you to wake up. The things that are taking place in Joel's day, as we see around us, even in the midst of this quarantine, it is God calling out to you, wake up. Cry out to God. Seek a fast. Seek his help. The day of God is coming. The day of the Lord is coming Notice even the reaction of the animals. They're groaning. They're desperate. Creation itself is suffering because of our sinfulness. Paul will say that creation groans for the day of redemption. It wasn't just Adam and Eve that suffered and were kicked out of the garden when they sinned against God. All of their offspring had to come under the curse, including you and myself. And even then wasn't just humanity. It was all of creation. The animals. The earth itself. Because of our disobedience, because of our sin against God, our rebellion, the earth now groans and longs for the day of restoration. The Lord is our only hope of escaping this tribulation. Even fire is an expression of judgment. So what are you called to do right here, right now? Because this isn't just a word for Joel's people, it's a word for us as well. First, we ought to seek the Lord. I mean, what have we been doing for the last several weeks? We've been scrolling Facebook. We've been watching the news. We've been listening to all kinds of health reports and news reports. And, and so we're looking, talking about flattening the curve. We're talking about trying to find uh, the, the shortages and how they're able to be fixed so that we can all have toilet paper or Clorox or wipes. You know, we've, we've been glued to what the government and society is telling us. And we've been following step for step. And so many of us are anxious. Many of us are fearful. Many of us are frustrated. We're ready for the economy to open back up. We're ready for our state to open back up. And so we've turned to science. We've turned to media. All of this has drawn our attention. And what God is saying is, look to me first. Slow down. Go to God's word. Go to the Bible. Go to him in prayer. God is in control. None of this has caught him off guard. None of this has caught him by surprise. He is in control of all of these situations. He's in control of this entire situation. So we are called to seek him in humility, in repentance, and seek his help. We should also see this as... A warning to a greater disaster to come. As an invitation to turn to the Lord in salvation. Again, the message here of chapter 1 is the worst is yet to come. As bad as this locust invasion is, it pales in comparison to the final judgment. There's coming a day that's going to make Katrina and Floyd and earthquakes and pestilence and, and tornadoes, all of this pale in comparison. So we're called to be wise and trust in Jesus. 
these virus outbreaks that we go through, terrorism that we go through. Jesus says there are going to be rumors of wars, and and there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be pestilence. There's going to be all kinds of famines and everything else that takes place, and yet these are just birth pains. That, that, that great and dreadful day of the Lord is going to come. And you and I need to be prepared. We need to be ready for it. And the way that we're ready for it is by trusting in Jesus. Jesus took God's final judgment upon himself. He took God's wrath that's meant for you and me and our sins upon himself. He died in our place upon the cross so that you and I don't have to fear that final judgment. We don't have to fear that final day. There is a way of escape, and his name is Jesus. Look to him. Look to him for salvation. Turn to Jesus. If you knew that a deadly storm was approaching, and we do it every time a hurricane comes, You'd go get your emergency kit, you'd get your basic supplies. If you had had, had enough far advance notice of what was going to take place with this virus, you would have gone and gotten your supplies. When we know that disaster is about to strike, we prepare ourselves. Jesus alludes to it, if you knew that the thief was coming tonight, you would board up your house. You'd be prepared for that thief. You know judgment is coming. This is your warning. The day of the Lord is far greater than any storm that we'll ever have to deal with. Far greater than any virus that we will have to deal with. Far greater than any war, any pain, any pestilence. The day of the Lord's wrath is coming. But blessed are those who take refuge in Jesus. So that was the immediate judgment. There's also uh, intimate judgment, the the army invasion of chapter 2. And like chapter 1, there's a description of this invasion. There's a time of warning, and there's a call to repent and seek the Lord so that you can avoid the coming destruction. Here we see in verse 1, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will it be again after them through the years of all generations. Joe is saying, get the trumpets blowing, sound the alarm. Let everybody know, wake up, the day of the Lord is near. And this army here is associated with fire, again, just like what we saw in chapter 1 with the locusts. Verse 3, fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. It's so terrible that it's like the picture of the fall back in Genesis chapter 3. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. This is a a picture of power, of a vast army that's standing on the hillside ready to swoop down and level everything. If you're a fan of the Lord of the Rings with Tolkien, it's like that army of Mordor that's coming against the seven and their friends. We have the imagery of fear and dread in verse 6. Before them, people are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march each of, on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. They're unstoppable, Joel says. This army is going to execute its action masterfully. 
There's nothing going to hold them back. In fact, even creation is impacted. Verse 10, the earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. But I, then I want you to notice a shocking detail here. Look in verse 11. The Lord utters his voice before his army. For his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. His army. This army is sent by God. Whether it be the Assyrians or the Babylonians, it doesn't matter. Joe is saying they're instruments of God's judgment. They're instruments of God's wrath. This, this uh, despicable nation, this, this, you know, the, these nations that run after other gods who do horrendous human rights violations and you know, war crimes and all the unmanageable in, stuff, this army of heathens and godless pagans are sent by God. But you know, this shouldn't be surprising to you and to me. The Lord often used other nations to execute judgment on Israel. Now we're not told in Joel what prompts this judgment, but from the rest of the Old Testament, we know that it's idolatry that brings God's judgment time after time after time. You can go all the way back to you know, the Exodus and see this. In the book of Judges, you see this. With the kings and, and kings and chronicles, you see this. God judges idolatry because as we saw last week with Hosea, he considers it adultery. We're cheating on God. Notice... Again, he says there in verse 11 that the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure this day? What should they do? Again, we're told to return to the Lord. Look there, continuing in chapter 2, in verse 12. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Yet even now, there's time yet. Just like we'll see in Jonah as he goes to Nineveh, he shouts that judgment is coming. Here, Joel is shouting judgment is coming, but yet there's time to repent. Heed the warning. Why? Because the Lord wants our hearts, not just our external actions as we see there in verse 13, that returning to the Lord isn't just a matter of crying out to him, God forgive me, God save me, but it's actually turning in our ways. Repentance means turning back, doing a 180 and going back to him. Returning to the Lord means to give him our whole heart, just as we saw last week with Hosea. We do this in a decisive way by trusting Christ as our Savior. And we do it daily by living a life of repentance day in and day out. And the reason that we're called to do this, and the reason that we're able to do this, we see in verse 13, is that this is the character of God. He is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love relenting over disaster. This is the God who woos us as we saw last week. This is what love is all about. Return to the Lord. And it's not just you and, and me to do this individually, but we do it corporately. We do it together. Notice verses 15 through 17. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a psalm and assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber between the vestibule and the altar. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. Make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? This is an urgent summons. Gather the children, gather the nursing infants, postpone the wedding. Everything else 
needs to take second place. Everything else needs to take the back seat. The most important thing that needs to be done right here, right now, is to gather to the Lord. Again, just like what we're going to see with Jonah and Nineveh. All people are called to repent and fall on their face before God, to cry out before him, ask for the Lord's blessing, glorify his name. You want to see revival take place? It begins with us as individuals to begin with, but then it spreads out to the, to the congregation, to all of God's people. It needs to be a corporate time where people turn to the Lord, just like we've had a call to the prayer this past week nationally on Tuesday as well as Thursday, as really this ought to be a time as we have slowed down and really tried to ponder what's most important. This ought to be a time that we are seeking God's face. Seeking his mercy, pleading in prayer before God to have mercy upon us. So that's immediate judgment, intimate, uh, imminent judgment, and then there's ultimate or final judgment. Look over to, to chapter 3. These two invasions of the locusts and the army are just previews of the ultimate judgment to come. It includes the oppressors in Israel's history as well as the judgment on all nations to come. So we're going to read verses 1 through 16 and just roll with it. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and that's not a literal valley. Jehoshaphat means a place of judgment. So it's not really a geographical location, but it's a, a call, a remembrance that God judges. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people and have traded a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine and have drunk it. What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? If you're paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily. For you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried my rich treasures into your temples. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. Behold, I will stir them up from the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your payment on your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters to the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, to a nation far away, for the Lord has spoken. So that's what God is going to do there with the final judgment upon Assyria and Babylon. But notice what he's going to do here in the future. Going into verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations, consecrate for war, store up, stir up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say I'm a warrior. This is a reverse of Micah 4, 3 in that day where it's, he's speaking about peace and you're supposed to take your spears and your swords and beat them into plowshares and pruning hooks. Here is the exact opposite of that. No, your, your farming implements need to be made for war. Then hasten and come, all you surrounding nations. Gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. And here's the surprise here. The nations have been called to make war. They've been gathered to make war. But when they show up, there really isn't a war that's taking place. It's actually God's judgment. He is sitting in judgment of the nations. He has called them on account of their behavior. Put the, in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread for the winepress is full. The vats overflow for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes. So all the people here, all the world's peoples are here in judgment. In the valley of, de, of decision or valley of verdict. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon are darker than the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. And that last verse is so important here. The Lord, on one hand, is a lion to be feared. But on the other hand, 
is a place of refuge and safety. Just two choices that lay before each and every one of us, and only two. To either come to him for safety and refuge through Jesus Christ, or to go the way of the nations and face the, the roaring lion of Judah. There's not multiple paths to God. There's not multiple ways to find happiness in life. There are not multiple ways that, you know, that we can make our way and we all end up in the same place. No, there are two paths and two paths alone. Either to be in Christ or not in Christ. Either to know him as a place of refuge and safety or to know him as a roaring lion who's going to devour in judgment. And the choice is yours. Joel says, be ready, be wise, be prepared. Judgment, far worse than you can ever imagine, is coming. All of what we can throw our minds at and what we've experienced, who would have ever thought we would have been experiencing what we're experiencing right now? So the worst that our minds can come up with pales in comparison to what that final judgment is going to be. Find refuge in Jesus, because that final judgment is far worse than you can imagine. And so that leads us to our Joel's second point here. While judgment is far worse than you can imagine, salvation is far much greater than you can imagine. Go back to chapter 2, picking back up in verse 18. And there's a shift in tense here, and the rest of the book is looking into the future and is filled with promises. First is the blessing of Joel's day, a time of rejoicing is coming. These invasions are going to be put behind them. Notice what it says there in verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. He, he's promising restoration, and he's doing this because he acts out of jealousy, not in a bad way, not in an envious way, but in a way that won't, he wants to see honor and glory and people to recognize their need. Notice verse 19, the Lord answered and said to his people, he answered their prayer, he's going to send blessing. I'm going to send to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will take the invading army, whether it's Assyria or Babylon, and I'm going to remove them. It's gone. I'm going to take everything. And notice what he says there in verse 20. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him to a parched and desolate land. His vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will arise for he has done great things. Now earlier I said that you know these verses wouldn't be ones that we'd want to put on a daily affirmation calendar. Most southerners probably would want to put verse 20 here, wouldn't you? We want to see the northerner removed. And there's really only two types of Yankees. Uh, and I'm just kidding for all my Yankee friends out there. You know that uh, we love you most of the time. Uh, you no, know, what he's speaking about here is not those that come down here and don't go back. No, he's referring to armies that normally armies come in from the north. Invaders come in from the north. And so the Lord is intervening and saving them. And all that's left behind is the smell of corpses. So notice what he says in light of this in verses 21 and 22. Fear not, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and vine give its yield. Twice we hear these words, fear not. Things are going to be restored, including the land itself. Remember, the land is growing, the, groaning. The land is desolate because it's cursed. It's, it's dealing with all of, uh, of Israel's sin. And here God is saying, not am I just going to redeem the people, but I'm going to redeem the land as well. Verse 23, be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. He's poured down for you abundant rain, the early and latter rain as before. The joy is restored stored because the, the rain is being poured down upon the people. 
It's being lavished upon them. Notice verse 24. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I have sent among you. He's saying here that all of life's necessities are going to be given back to you. Your food, your wine, your oil. Indeed, this, this restoration of the land is just a preview of that final restoration of the new creation that's going to come. All the promises of the Old Testament find their way through Christ to full restoration. Verse 25 would definitely be what you would want to put on the calendar. Indeed, it's an anticipation of the gospel It's a vivid picture of our pain and our suffering and despair and what God is willing to do graciously and provide hope to us. The people of Joel's day were living in despair because of the plague. But look at the promise here. This idea of restore means to repay or or pay back, to make up for. He does not owe us a repayment. He does not owe us anything, and yet this is how gracious our God is. And the truth of this is that we will not fully experience it until the new creation comes and the new heavens and the new earth and God makes his dwelling place among us. We might get to realize some of it now. We might get a little bit of this back. But full anticipation and full realization does not come until the last days. God is going to reverse the curse All that took place in the Garden of Eden as Adam and Eve sinned and and fell. All of the paradise that was lost. When we get to Revelation, we see it's all regained. It's restored. It's renewed. That's really, you know, what's the the beauty behind the the scriptures. It's the overarching story of, of creation, of fall, of redemption and restoration. God is making all things new. He is restoring back to us what we rebelled against. That's how good our God is. And it's not just in Joel's day. But he goes on to speak about salvation in the last days where God's spirit is going to be poured out. Here is probably one of the most important Old Testament promises about the Holy Spirit. In fact, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost begins with Peter's exposition of this text. In verse 28, Joel says, And it shall come to pass afterwards. Peter says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares. And then he goes on to quote the rest of the passage. So what Peter is realizing is that Joel is not speaking about his day in, in his time period with the locusts and all that. No, Joel is speaking about a future day. And, and Peter is saying, hey, we are realizing, we are living in those days that Joel spoke about. They began at Pentecost and they will continue until Christ's return. You and I are living in the last days as God's spirit is poured out. Peter will go on to say that this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. The final chapter of history is taking place right here, right now. Christ ushered it in with his his life and his ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection. It it continued through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we're living in that time now. Look at how great our salvation is in in the rest of it. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit What Joel is saying here is, contrary to normal accepted belief where where God was with old Jewish men, he's saying, listen, God's Spirit is on everybody, young and old, male and female, whether they're free or servant. God's Spirit isn't just reserved for one special class of people. No, God wants to bless all people. It's poured out on all people regardless of their gender, 
regardless of their age, regardless of their class. Indeed, the, the, the hope of Moses has come true where he, he dreams of that day of greater spiritual activity where Moses desires that, that all of God's people would be filled with God's Spirit. Joel goes on to insert an end times judgment scene. Peter is going to include it in his sermon, though we know it has not yet arrived. And he describes cosmic wonders and unnatural events and wars, blood and fire and smoke like what we see in the Exodus. And Jesus speaks about these things that are coming with the Son of Man, how darkness covered the earth during the crucifixion, that and, and we see this throughout significant moments in redemptive history where dramatic wonders are taking place. And Peter finishes his quote here in verse 32, the first part, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Peter makes it clear that this Lord is Jesus Christ himself. Paul will quote this text in Romans chapter 10, speaking to the necessity of faith. We are called on the... We are, we are encouraged to call on the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, to be saved. This is the difference between being religious and being in a relationship. Salvation is far greater than you've ever dreamed, ever imagined, because the Spirit of God comes and dwells in every believer. And that leads us to the, the, the day that God dwells with his people. In verses 17 through 21 of chapter 3, we see a couple of things very quickly here. The book ends with the certainty of God dwelling with his people. And to know that they are holy, that they are satisfied, and that they are different. Notice what he says in verse 17 of chapter 3. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. And Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall become a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness for the violence done to the people of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood. Blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. Salvation is coming from Zion, and salvation will be present in Zion. This is a fulfillment of what God promises to David in 2 Samuel 7. Where God promised to David, I will establish your throne forever. And he wasn't talking about David. He wasn't talking about Solomon or Rehoboam or any of the other immediate descendants. The, that never happened. The nation was carried off into exile. So did God's promise fall short? <laughs> no, not at all. Because God was looking to his son to be born of a virgin in the line of David who would live a sinless life, who would die as an innocent hung between two thieves, who would be raised life three days later. He would be that king that sits upon the throne forever. It would be Jesus, the better David, and because of this, Jesus is going to be able to bring in a new creation, a new Eden, and God's people are going to be able to dwell with him. The land that is promised to Abraham is involved in being a blessing to the nations. We're told that strangers will not enter in, and what he means that is those who do not belong or know, to, know the Lord. Strangers are always welcome in Israel, and, and people are instructed to treat them uh, with grace and hospitality. But what he's saying here is strangers are those who are strangers to God's salvation. At that point, it's going to be too late to enter in. At that point, it's going to be too late to turn to Jesus. 
Nothing unclean will ever enter into it, Revelation tells us, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those that are known by Jesus will be able to enter. Jesus says as much in Matthew 7. The, even those that call him Lord, Lord, and did great works and deeds in his name. Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. They're strangers to him. Because they might have done good things, they might have worked for his name, but they did not know him and he did not know them. Indeed, they will be strangers. Not only will God's people be holy, but they also will be satisfied. This new creation, this new creation, this new Jerusalem is a picture of a return to Eden. It's a glorious picture of the messianic kingdom. Wine is sweet, not bitter. It will ooze out of the grapes. Milk will flow. Waters will rush down. This exceeds the picture of restoration that we see back with the locust plague. Nothing that we have ever experienced can come close to what the prophet is trying to convey. The curse will finally be lifted. Paradise will be restored. We can only imagine what Eden was like back in that day. And yet we're going to be able to experience it. That, those who are in Christ will be able to experience Eden on this final day. And what is the source of this blessing? Joel tells us a supernatural provision. And ultimately, this is going to cause us to be different. God's people will be different from everyone else. He compares us to Egypt and Edom in this case. Where Egypt represents worldly power, Edom represents hostility toward God's people as we see in the book of Obadiah. Judah is going to be inhabited forever. And there's going to be total peace as God's enemies are defeated, as the Lord dwells in Zion. This theme of judgment on the nations is going to be picked up in Amos as well. But ultimately the Lord has the last word on all injustice. Whether it's unarmed black men who are shot down in cold blood, or whether it's uh, the poor that are being oppressed and objectified, the rich that keep getting richer, whether it's the criminal justice system that is, is stacked against certain individuals, whatever injustice that's taking place, Joel is saying here that there's coming a day when it all will be made right. That God will vindicate himself and he will vindicate his people. No one is going to get away with anything. Even though it appears here and now, there's coming a day of reckoning. And God will bring justice. So you and I are called to trust the Lord with our whole heart. And we're given the picture of our everlasting kingdom that consists of true believers from all the nations where God has gathered a people for himself. And it's a foretaste of what we see in Revelation 21 and 22 where we see God dwelling his, with his people forever apart from tears and pain and locusts and wars and death and uh, all kinds of injustice. So Joel says, to be prepared for that day, flee to Christ. Run to Jesus. Find refuge and solace in him. Judgment is far worse than you can imagine, and yet salvation is far greater than you can imagine. And if you are in Christ today, you have nothing to fear. You're safe. He's coming quickly. Our holiness is going to be deepened and renewed. Our souls are going to be satisfied forever. We're going to see him as he is, and we're going to be transformed into his likeness. So fear not. Don't fear what man can do to us, because we're in Christ. But if you're not in Christ today, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. 
flee to him, run to him, repent and turn back to him. He is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He and he is not willing that you would perish, but wants you to come to everlasting life. To call upon him. Cry out to him. Fall down in repentance to him. And claim Christ as your refuge. Let's pray. Well, indeed, I pray that we would heed your warning today. Father, that we would know that as great and troublesome as the day is that we, in which we live, that there's coming a far greater day of judgment. There's coming a far worse time of, of pain and suffering and turmoil. And Lord, I pray that we are prepared and we are ready for that day. As we think about that and we think about this great eternal question of who will be saved, we've heard the answer this morning. It's all who will call on the name of the Lord. So, Lord, in this moment, I pray that if there's someone listening that has not done that, that they would do that right here and right now. That they would call on the name of the Lord that they would know your salvation, they would know your forgiveness, they would know your freedom, knowing that Christ took your wrath upon himself for us, for our rebellion, for our sin, for our shortcomings, nor that they would run to you for safety and security, nor for the believer who has done this, that this would be a reminder that you are that place of refuge, that you are that place of safety and security. And so we have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to fear. Regardless of how bad things get here, we, we know that we are saved from that greater and far worse day that's coming. But in the meantime, may we sound the alarm. Just as Joel did, may we sound that alarm, sound that warning, telling people to wake up, Just as we would chase someone down if we knew that they were standing in the midst of danger in the railroad tracks or out in the middle of the road or or a storm was coming, as we would give warning in those great emergencies, Lord, I pray that we would sound the warning here and now. That we would proclaim to all of those that are in harm's way that there is a place of refuge, a place of safety. Father, may we follow the leading of your Holy Spirit that lead, that resides within us. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to encourage you and invite you to, to respond to what God has put upon your heart today. If you're not a believer, if you not put your faith and trust in Christ, that would be my, my plea with you. It's to heed the warning of Joel and that you would respond in faith. And if you want to do that or if you have done that, I want you to reach out to us through our contact information, uh, whether it be on our website, uh, leastchapelofwb.church, or you can respond to uh, you you viewing this on YouTube or Facebook, however you're viewing this today. But, I want you to reach out to us. Let us know that you've got some questions or you've made a decision. We want to be able to pray with you, help you, walk with you along these next steps as you seek to listen to the Lord and call upon his name. And even as a believer, if, if there's something that you're working through and dealing with, we want to be there for you as well. So reach out to us, contact us, and we know that we'll be praying that God will continue to to stir his people, to do great and mighty things for him. I pray God's blessing be upon us all until we can gather again.